when we apply the concept of resonance to speech, there are aspects of uh, different types of resonators that are relevant to how the vocal tract influences the sound source of phonation. When talking about resonators which enhance sounds or filters which remove sounds, they're kind of two sides of the same thing, so we can use that terminology for both. Um, bandwidth is a range of frequencies that a resonator or a filter will have an effect on, so that bandwidth can be relatively wide. In the case of a resonator, then, a relatively large number of frequencies would be enhanced, or that can be relatively narrow, so that a small number of frequencies are affected. Stiffness refers to how quickly a resonator changes with response to uh, changes to the input frequency or the uh, forcing frequency of the resonance. And damping refers to how much energy gets absorbed by the resonator or filter uh, as the sound propagates through it. In the case of the vocal tract, uh, it's got a wide bandwidth. Uh, it responds pretty quickly to changed frequencies, which would be a low stiffness. And um, vibrations are dampened fairly rapidly because it is a tube of skin uh, over muscle or bone, depending on where in the vocal tract you are. Uh, common descriptions of uh, filters that are used to remove sounds from things uh, are a low-pass filter, which allows relatively low frequencies to get through, or frequencies above a certain level are removed or attenuated is the term that is used. A high-pass filter allows relatively high frequency sounds to get through, meaning frequencies below a certain level are attenuated. And a band pass filter has a, a band of frequencies, a range between a low and a high cutoff, um, where uh, frequencies are removed. Um, the uh, slope of filter is how steep that cutoff is, so the transition from frequencies that are let through to frequencies that are attenuated. That can be more gradual or it can be steeper. Um, the term broadband filter is used for something that would attenuate all frequencies, so that would be um, something like some uh, noise-reducing headphones, for example. Uh, passive noise canceling, like having ear cups over your ears, would just uh, quiet all uh, frequencies to some degree. We can uh, visualize how a um, a resonator or a filter affects sounds with something called a resonator curve. It gives us a graph of how the resonator responds to a sound uh, for any given particular input. Um, so for each frequency we get an idea of whether uh, the sound is amplified or not. Uh, here we have two examples of resonance curves. On the left um, we have a uh, something that uh, looks a little bit like a vocal tract resonance where there is a peak frequency around 15 or 1600 Hertz where the sound is enhanced uh, and uh, as you move away from that peak we gradually drop off to cases where the sound is uh, attenuated to some extent. On the right we have an example of um, a filter that might be created to remove low frequency sound from something. In this case it looks like the cutoff is around uh, uh, 900 to 1000 Hertz and there's a relatively sharp change from uh, low um, uh, or I should say a lot of filtering where a lot of amplitude is removed from the sound to uh, no filtering uh, where the effect is about zero for frequencies above that cutoff. So when we apply these concepts to the vocal tract, we get vocal tract resonances that are uh, somewhat like that picture on the left. Um, but those uh, resonators have a low stiffness, so the resonance changes very rapidly as articulation change. Um, recall that we have a waveform display that shows us changes in displacement or air pressure over time. That's good for examining how long something happens or when something changes. 
We have a spectrum that provides frequency information over an interval of time that gives us a static picture of frequency. Given how the ear works, we're actually more interested in the frequency display because the cochlea in the ear breaks down sound uh, into uh, a, uh, a range of frequencies to um, stimulate different nerves in the auditory system. In speech, we have a lot of information uh, happening in a, a short amount of time. So the frequencies are constantly changing. So what we are interested in is a way to look at speech where we can see uh, rapid time changes, but where we can also see um, uh, those, those frequency information pieces. We will take a look at a visualization for that changing frequency information over time uh, a little bit later. For now, let's return to the vocal tract as a resonator. We can simulate what vocal tract resonances are like by considering the vocal tract as a tube. When looking at the resonances of tubes, um, there are specific frequencies that will create standing waves within a tube. Some of the demonstrations of waves uh, visualized using strings will show you um, what those waves look like over a fixed space. In the case of a tube that's closed off at both ends, sound waves will reflect off of the end in a particular way that the uh, standing wave wavelengths are twice the length of the tube. The lowest frequency will be the one with a wavelength exactly two times the length of the tube. And then any multiple of that lowest frequency, so frequencies that are uh, higher in multiples of that lowest frequency, will also be resonances. The reason this happens um, is a little bit like uh, pushing someone who's swinging on a swing. Um, the sound reflection off of the end of the, sorry, the far end of the tube from the source will be in sync with the sound source. Um, if we let the sound wave travel the length of the tube and then back before we reinforce it with uh, additional um, pressure. Um, turns out, for kind of weird reasons, um, that we would also get the same resonances out of a tube that is open at both ends. Um, all right. Um, and the string demonstration where uh, uh, one of the ends, or the far end, I should say, is fixed, um, gives you an example of kind of how this reflection works. So in a, a visual sort of format, um, uh, we have a positive pressure uh, emerging from uh, the larynx, which we would visualize as on the left side of this tube. That positive pressure wave would travel down the length of the tube, at the speed of sound until it hits the closed end. When it hits the closed end, it reflects back and begins to travel back down the tube. And if we uh, wait to inject more positive pressure until it has traveled back to the sound source on the left, that would be the ideal time to uh, push like somebody on a swing or to enhance the positive pressure and increase that positive pressure. So if we're releasing bursts of positive pressure, such as releasing puffs of air through the vocal folds during phonation, when those puffs of air are in sync with the length uh, of the tube, uh, we will get the loudest possible uh, information uh, out of that sound. So to switch over to the math side of this, if we have a closed tube with a length of 15 centimeters, what would its lowest resonance frequency be? Uh, well, we would get that by having a sound with a, a wavelength that's two times the length of the tube, or 30 centimeters. A sound with a wavelength of 30 centimeters is going to have a frequency of speed of sound, 34,000. 400 divided by that 30 centimeters, and that's going to give us 1,147 hertz, or answer C. Since any multiple is also a resonance, if I take that and multiply it by 2, I get 2290 
3.3, I put 22.94 on here, so I was being lazy about decimal points. Um, that would also be a resonance. Um, if I double that again, I get 456.6. So actually, this is a terrible multiple choice question because both C and D would be uh, resonances for that. So unless I was being specific about the second resonance, there are two correct answers in this particular part of the question. Now, when we go to a tube that is open at just one end, uh, we get a little bit of uh, weirdness, or maybe more weirdness than we've had so far, since you probably find all of this kind of weird. Um, the lowest frequency resonance in that tube is one that's going to be four times the length of the tube. And also any odd multiples of that resonance um, are also going to resonate well in that tube. The reason why is that when the sound hits the open end of the tube, a wave is reflected back with a reversed pressure. So when the positive pressure hits the end of the tube, a negative pressure wave uh, gets propagated back. You could kind of think of the um, positive air pressure pushing on all that air in the outside world, and since there's a lot more air in the outside world, when it overreacts and pushes back, it uh, overreacts even more excessively, uh, leaving you with an, an extra, um, uh, extra strong change in pressure. Okay. Um, so uh, I have a, a visualization of that on the next slide, but as I mentioned um, previously, a tube open at both ends is just like a tube that's closed at both ends. We also have another way we can approximate what happens in the vocal tract by treating a case where we have a very narrow opening as not open, but as being closed. So as we start to apply these models to actual speech sounds, um, a little bit later on in the class in Unit 3, um, we'll come back to these simulations and make some that are more specifically applied to speech sounds. So in the case of the half-open tube, we have a sound source like the larynx again on the left. When it injects some positive pressure, that positive pressure travels down the length of the tube. When it hits the open end, it switches to negative pressure and then that negative pressure wave travels back toward the source. Since that source side is closed, or nearly closed because the larynx is there, um, that negative pressure will bounce and head back toward the open end. When it hits the open end, the negative pressure will flip back to positive pressure, giving us that reverse bounce at the open end, and then it travels back to the source. We now have a positive pressure at the source, and that would be a great time to add additional positive pressure uh, in order to make this wave as strong as possible. So this pressure wave has traveled up and back along the tube four times now making uh, a wavelength of four times the length of the tube a, a great uh, frequency to use um, uh, in order to get a resonance. In the, case, sorry, in the case of a closed tube, all of the multiples worked, but in the case of an open tube, if we used a frequency that was twice as fast, we would be adding more positive pressure or pushing right when this negative pressure is down at the larynx end and bouncing, and we would cancel it out. Adding positive pressure to that negative pressure is going to be destructive interference, and that's going to make that wave weaker. So we can't use all multiples. Any even multiple is going to have this problem where as the resonance gets, or as the wave propagates down the tube, it's going to come back and hit the source side right as we have a negative wave approaching. Um, so we need to use odd multiples of that resonance. Okay, so if we have a half open tube with a length of 15 centimeters, its lowest resonance is going to be a wavelength of four times that, or 60. So I would have 34,400 divided by 60, four times that 15, gives me 573 as my lowest resonance. And then since odd multiples are resonances, I would multiply that by 3 
to get 1720, so 1719 works. Uh, I'm going to divide that by 3 again to get me back to my original resonance. I can multiply that by 5, and that gets me 2867 as a resonance. Divide that by my 5, I can multiply that by 7, and get 4013. Divide that again by 7, multiply it by 9, get 5160. Um, trying to see if we're going to actually get 6882 as one of these answers or not. Uh, 6306 is a resonance, so I think 1719 is the only answer that works correctly in this case. So this isn't as bad a multiple choice question as my last one. Okay, so we have two basic equations for uh, simulating vocal tract uh, as a resonator. For the case of a uh, closed at both ends or open at both ends tube, uh, wavelengths that are double the length of the tube are good resonators and any multiple. In the case of a half open tube, which is probably your classic example of the vocal tract because you have the closed off end at the larynx and the open end at the lips, uh, our resonance is going to be uh, a wavelength with four times the length of the tube and all odd multiples of that resonance.